good to be here. So I'm Linda Hogan and this is Terry Daniels and we are two-thirds of a worker-owner co-op called Our World which provides training and consulting uh, to and software to time banks. Does everybody know what a time bank is? Does anybody not know what it is? You know? Okay. So they go by many names. Service exchanges is another name for them. It's a community organization in which Members um, share time, and all the services are valued equally, which is beautiful. So one hour of any service is equal to one hour of any other service. It cuts through all the class issues, it cuts through all the, m the cash economy issues, and it says that I'm as valuable as the person that I'm exchanging with, which is beautiful. The other big part of it is reciprocity. So you have equality and you have reciprocity. It's not barter, it's actually IRS tax exempt because the IRS wisely ruled that you can't tax time, which is really good. And it's also not a one-to-one -one exchange. I could do a service for Mira, and Mira does a service for Terry, and Terry does a service for JJ. And we all have our own accounts, so we know when we've credited by doing a service and when we've debited by receiving a service. There are many of them across the country, but it's hard to know how many. There are about 300 on record. Um, they vary in size from 25 to a couple thousand, and some of them are general, neighbor to neighbor, any kind of service, and some of them are specialized, like maybe in hospitals, or prisons, or work with youth. Um, it depends, again, on what the community wants and who they have um, as members. So that's a little wrap on time banking, and now we're going to give you some scoop on co-ops, because I know that's what you really want to know. Yeah, and this is, is this audience mostly co-op people? Is that... Uh, and just nonprofit, okay. Yeah, yeah great. Um, my work in time banking and co op started uh, on Long Island, New York, around housing renovations. But I, uh, is anybody, are, are folks familiar with the self help cooperatives that started here in California in the 30s? Yeah. 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 This is pretty cool because this is, it's, my story kind of evolved similarly but without a Great Depression, <laughs> but around a housing crisis in New York as far as um, affordable housing for folks. So I'm just going to run down the self-help cooperatives, and it kind of informs what a community co-op is, which we'll talk about a little bit later on as well. So 1930s, everybody knows the story, 25% unemployment. Um, it predates Social Security and the WPA and state relief and federal relief. Pretty much at that time, all you had was local charities, and most folks um, didn't have access to, to anything, so they pretty much were on their own. Um, so during the Great Depression, we have plenty of production, lots of uh, fruit grown on the trees, lots of factories uh, ready to work, but money dried up and created this crisis that was the Great Depression. So this group around kitchen tables, uh, soup kitchens, um, tent cities, and Hoovervilles ac around California conversations started happening like what do we do there's no money but we all still have needs we still need to eat spring of 1932 a, a man who's um, walked out from LA to the farms locally work offered his labor basically uh, to the farmer and walked home with more food than he could carry well the next day another guy goes with him and in about two months they've got 500 members in the unemployment cooperative relief fund and as far as we know this is the first one of these Eventually, it was 45 that were attached to this group, and about 150,000 Californians received aid from, from uh, these self-help cooperatives. And it spreads to about 1.3 million people in the United States across 30 states. So they were just as innovative for whatever they needed. You know, they created a warehouse, distribution center, gas station, you name it. Um, they operated democratically. Uh, they formed cooperatives. And their benefits were allocated to their needs. So if you had four kids, uh, and I had two kids, we made sure the four kids were fed just the same as my two kids. Um, they, the social support was also important. People were getting thrown out of their houses, which is you know, it's eerily familiar when you read about these things to today's uh, news. Um, and they were, res they were basically resisting evictions. And when people got evicted, they'd move them back into the houses. So these empty houses, you know, the people started looking out for each other in this uh, interesting way. Uh, also, some unemployed uh, utility workers, because they knew how to turn the power back on, were turning the power back on. So <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. Um, typically, these were time credit systems. And the way they worked was an hour was 100 points. 
So you paid for and you received points for stuff that you had. It could have been a broken tool. It could have been your labor. Um, there was no hierarchy of skills. This was uh, everybody's hour was equal, which is a, a concept that's uh, familiar to time bankers. Um, so they could get whatever they needed here f from these cells. As these things grew, once you get to about 500 members, you're able to provide a lot of the needs uh, of the community. And a very key principle, this is key for time banking, this is key for the work that I did around housing, and also these self-help uh, cooperatives, was members getting members. So if Linda needed something, it was Linda's obligation to kind of recruit people in the community, to bring more members in. The network effect, they realize the more people we have, the better off we all are. So that's 1930s, 2005, I'm on Long Island. Um, a f a one friend of mine in particular was um, looking to get housing, but the real estate prices were going through the roof, and affordable housing for working class folks was, was getting out of reach. Uh, I think for lower class folks that was happening probably in the 70s on Long Island. So this hit home and we uh, basically looked around at a group of us and we said, you know, between uh, five or six of us, we have skills as carpenters, as uh, interior decorators. We decided to create this cooperative called Long Island Home Enterprise. It was, we renovated houses and we flipped them and we were hoping, you know, maybe nine or ten houses in, one of our members would have enough equity in our co-op uh, to purchase one of these houses. But the basic concept was this, it was profits divided by hours. Everybody's hour was equal, as many hours as you work, and it was open to anybody in the community to come out and earn hours. Um, you could build your equity account. And the other mechanism that we had, which was like time banking, was that you could trade your hours. So this freaky little thing, uh, <laughs> we had about 50 or 60 people over the couple of years that we did this. And what was amazing was people coming out, not just for affordable housing, but to learn stuff, to socialize. So that story of the self-help cooperatives really resonates for me personally because we saw it happen in New York. With the housing collapse, ironically, we you know, were put out of business by uh, real estate prices dropping and people being able to afford houses. And also it didn't make sense for us as a co-op to buy houses because our goal was profit to share profit. So at that time, uh, somewhere along the line, I had heard about time banking Someone says, you guys sound like a time bank. And we had gone up to Portland, Maine, where Linda worked, uh, and received trainings on how to become a time bank ourselves. So when we dissolved, we cashed everybody out of Home Enterprise, and I started working up in Portland, Maine. And we were waiting for, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of digest the, the community co-op model. Because what we were doing on Long Island, we didn't know what to call it. It was a co-op, it was a time bank. And I'm just going to give you some basic principles of what a community co-op is. And Linda, in a few minutes, will explain specifically uh, the one that we created next. So community co-ops. Um, typically in a time bank, it's, it's a couple hours that we trade with member to member. But to mobilize people around a big task, like painting a house or uh, building a deck or anything like that, that's typically something time banks don't do. So a community co-op forms to deal with big projects, to deal with projects that have a specific set of skills or a specific set of tools that are needed. Um, and that's kind of all it takes is just, you know, good management, good tools, and a bunch of people thrown at a task. So possible community co-ops, home repair, weatherization, uh, community gardens, it really stretches them on. Anything you can do with groups and anything that needs specific management or tools. Solar circles, we talked to a group down in Santa Fe about a pool of people getting together, maybe five or ten members, and committing to solarize each other's houses with at the center of that circle um, a skilled solar technician. So you got the brains and the smarts and the tools, but the community's en energy to mobilize and do the homes for one another. So I'm going to speak about the benefits uh, from, for the co-op partners. And a co-op partner could be an existing business. It doesn't have to be a cooperative. It could be a cooperative. And it could be a cooperative form by the time bank itself. So the benefits for this group is, in, the, in Portland's uh, exchange, we have about 800 members up there. It's, it's access to this huge labor pool to get a job done. Um, it's access to customers. And also in the situation with the, uh, our community co-op up there, we had access to the administration and the fax machine and the phone and all the kind of things you need to start a business. So it's kind of like a business incubator there as well. The benefits for the exchange members. So members can earn hours weatherizing, uh, home repair, 
they can earn hours uh, just because they wanted to learn some new skills. Um, and then they can, they can obviously divest their hours in the time bank or in the community co-op for projects they, they want to get done. And also a key thing was the, the co-op tools. Once you start getting a bunch of tools together, um, you can get a lot of things done. So the benefits to the time bank, this was uh, supporting local businesses. Um, it, it's a great way to mobilize when we uh, were doing the housing work that we were doing. Two friends would tell two friends, and all of a sudden you had more people coming in. So it's a great way to mobilize people. Um, and also in Portland, we found that having a specific thing, a time bank does a lot of things really well, but no one thing, enough to raise grants and things like that. So we found with a particular project, uh, we call it the crying baby. You know, you're, you're able to go to a grant organization. Like, here's what we did, and here's specific numbers around that. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Linda at this point. Um, Kennedy? Yeah. So our Exchange Portland has mm -hmm. been around since 1996. We have about 800 members. We exchange about 15,000 hours of service a year. If you take the United Way's value for volunteer, they value it at about $20 an hour. So 15,000 hours of social capital of exchanges is about $300,000 <coughs> that we contribute back and forth in the community. That's helped us have um, foundations look at us seriously. In the early days when it started, and I was a founding member in 96, and I knew the president of the United Way, and I knew the city, and I knew everyone, and they all just kind of laughed and said, no way, this is going to fly, and they couldn't understand the value. Terry calls it the crying baby, and that's really a good example. It wasn't appealing, it didn't tug at your heartstrings because it was too, heartstrings because it was too general. They just couldn't get that people exchanging hours could really be building community together. Even though we had marriages come out of it, divorces, you know, funerals. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've also had babies be born for time dollars. We've had people get married. We've had um, all kinds of parties and celebrations and birthdays. We've had small businesses be developed. Everything from writing business plans and resumes and business cards. Um, things that, that other organizations do, people do for time. And the coolest part about it is you do the time on your time. So it's not nine to five. You don't have to show up except when you say you're going to show up and you can make it work in your lifestyle. So um, I told everybody, I think, uh, recently that our favorite member that really knows, lives this life, had two children for time. She had her home weatherized for time. She got childcare done for time. She became, started a small business as a foodie, opening uh, a home foods program where she delivers meals to houses. And she's a musician, so now she's getting a CD done for time. If you did the cash value of that, it would be, pretty expensive any one of those but she lives that way it really works so for uh, 10 years we were really lucky because Richard Rockefeller was the founder here for, for in the Portland program and he financially supported us he paid for all of our expenses soup to nuts which was really generous but unfortunately the members never thought that there needed to be any money to pay for the lights or to pay for a coordinator because we had this very generous benefactor so over time he said you know, I need to wean myself, and we started collecting donations of $25 a person. And then we started looking for grants and projects. But we were so efficient and doing so well, we still couldn't make the case until 2008. In 2008, one of our um, beloved members, Fred, walked in. Terry and I were having a meeting. We were talking about the cold winter and the rising oil prices and what a, a different cold it was going to be in Maine, which is really cold. And Fred walked in and he said, um, a relative of mine died, and I have $10,000 inheritance, and I would like to give it to you to weatherize some people's homes. About $500 a pop, we'll put insulation in the attics, and you can make a difference. So here, you know, do what you can do. And we stopped him and said, let's think about this and see what we could do with that money. So that $10,000 garnered another $10,000 match, and then garnered some more monies for some more grants. And we were able to create a co-op. It was a worker-owned co-op, and that co-op's intention was to provide weatherization, <coughs> comprehensive soup to nuts, do an energy audit and evaluation in the home, and then go in and do really serious weatherization. We did that for a while, um, and we returned some money. We actually had $19,000 profit that first year, and that profit went back to our exchange, to the time bank, and that supported the coordinator's position. Does that make sense? 
So it was really good. It was a small business that returned and helped the nonprofit to be able to keep the doors going, doors open. But we realized that um, through that, that a lot of what people wanted and needed the most was small services. They needed um, caulking, they needed plastic on windows, they needed door stoppers, they needed things that cost less money, were less intensive, and didn't require uh, a lot of skills. It also helped with insurance because of safety. So Terry and I worked on this a lot with our partner Kennedy, and what we came up with is step one. So step one became a program of our exchange, of our time bank. In step one, the first year, we did 36 members' homes. In the second year, we did about 65. In the third year, we did 101. And we're hoping to do 101 this year, which is really great. So members earn hours doing anything. They can walk a dog, they can do your hair, they can cut a CD for you, they can be a brain surgeon. We haven't quite got that, but we do have doctors. <laughs> we have a lot of doctors. In fact, a third of our exchanges, by the way, are for health care, um, traditional and non-traditional both giving and receiving, which is quite significant. So we also found a lot of people that needed health care, so they were excited. If they could go with a certified energy technician who is trained, give them a, a basic training, go into a house and do this work on somebody else's houses, they could earn those hours, put it in their account, and then they could exchange it for things like health care or anything else that they want, and we have over 1,800 services to choose from. So this became a really cool thing. We're now in the fourth year. We're hoping to do 100 houses this year. There have been three people that have gone through the program, and they've done more than 40 hours of service. And so they earned the right to go to the state and take a state exam to be a certified energy technician. And we got another grant to pay for that. So now we have neighbors helping neighbors, members helping each other. We have three people that have gotten trained gotten their certificate, and they can then supervise the workers. And now, two of those people are in a business, and they're going to go back to doing step two. So if I do your home with step one, we do the basic weatherization, but we say to you, you need an energy audit, and you really need to work on your attic. Then we can refer you to step two, which is people outside. They were in the time bank, but outside the time bank they can do that work and they can bring members with them who can earn hours which keeps the cost down for you for step two. Does that make sense? So it's cost saving, it's energy saving, it's fun, it's community building, everybody's there together and they're all earning hours and they're all helping each other. I'm, I, okay. I'm just going to wait till, okay. Um, so this is Kennedy who is the first person to go through the training program all dressed up in his hazmat suit. And this is why we decided not to have step two, because those suits are really hot. <laughs> and he didn't like being in the attic wearing those. Uh, and that's where step one came from for the program, is let's do the basic stuff where we don't have to have people fainting in attics on the hot days. Starting the co-op, as we said, it was a member need, it was member driven. That's always how it's going to work. When you are looking for the cash economy to support a program, it has to be organic. It has to be what does the program need, what do people need not somebody from the outside saying, here's a good idea. It's what do you all need in your community. The community co-op leadership, the skilled manager, which is the people that have the certified energy technician positions, they are the ones that keep the insurance low because they've got that credential. And then anybody else who works with them rides under their credential. Yeah. So members earn hours and skills, they gain skills, some of them find employment, some of them it's really great uh, field experience and they get to try out something new. Some of them like it, some of them don't. We have people in the queue this year that would like to go to the state and get certified. And some of them say, nah, I tried that, I don't want to, but maybe I want to be in the field of energy and I might want to work in an office or I want, might have a supporting role. We save money and reduce carbon emissions and of course we build community spirit in the exchange. So there isn't anything bad about it. The grants, and again, the crying baby, now we're attractive to funders because now it's tangible. We are weatherizing homes. We are giving people jobs. It's economic employment. It's community building. We were able to get materials. We bought a van for time dollars. We had materials donated for time dollars. We got training money grants um, that came in. The United Way got on board. Habitat for Humanity got on board. The University of Southern Maine set students. They got on board. Our green, we call them the green team with the members in um, the, our exchange. And we had people driving people to do 
the weatherization, so they are in time. We had people making meals for them, they are in time, brought water to them, they are in time. All of those ways supported each other. And the profit sharing, the best part is the community co-op will be able to utilize the labor and the skills of the time bank members, of the exchange members, keep the cost down when they do step two, and then return some of that profit to support the exchange. So it's a beautiful marriage between a co-op co and a time bank. Mm -hmm.